Welcome. As we continue our summer series Bible study on being transformed and looking at how God transforms different characters of Scripture. And we continue on this theme. Uh, Matt Hupel from the Woodlawn Church of Christ uh, is going to be speaking to us tonight on the topic of David, transformed from shepherd to king. Matt is another one of my good friends, and I'm excited uh, that he will be sharing a video with us tonight. Uh, Matt has been the minister at the Woodlawn Congreg Church of Christ uh, since 2005. Prior to that, he worked for 13 years in youth ministry, both at the Atlas Church of Christ and also the Jackson Heights Church of Christ, both in the Florence area. Uh, and Matt is preaching at the Woodlawn Church of Christ there in Florence. And uh, Matt is a great guy. He also teaches uh, Bible and other subjects at Mars Hill Bible School. Uh, he also is uh, on the adjunct fac faculty, I believe, at Heritage Christian University. Uh, he graduated from the University of North Alabama with a bachelor's, of, bachelor's degree of secondary education and also has a master's of ministry degree from Freed Hardeman University. Uh, Matt always does an excellent job and really makes you think about the subject at hand. And so I'm excited about hearing Matt and the message that he has to bring for us tonight about David transformed from shepherd to king. And I hope that this lesson will be beneficial for you. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Here's Matt. Good evening. Welcome to the Savannah Church of Christ uh, to their Wednesday night series. My name is Matt Hupel, and I'm just tickled to be able to be here with you. I really wish that I could be there with you uh, physically and we could sing together and praise God together, but uh, this is the means by which we've been doing things. And uh, I, I know it's uh, part of the world right now, but we pray that that's going to end very soon. But nevertheless, I do look forward to any opportunity that we can have to study God's Word together. There's a story told of three men who loved golf. These three men loved to play. They played just about every day they could. But one day they went out on the golf course and they saw a thunderstorm coming up, but they just continued to play through. And then this large bolt of lightning hit where they were playing and it killed all three of them. The good thing about it is all three of them were Christians, so they go up to heaven, and they're there as they enter the pearly gates. Peter is there introducing them to the gates of heaven and things that they're going to enjoy. And he asks them, before you go in, do you guys have any questions? Well, of course, they said, we, we've got one big question. That's all we really have. We want to know, is there golf in heaven? And Peter says, of course there's golf in heaven. I mean, we have a whole bunch of wonderful things in heaven. We have the best courses that you will ever be able to play. You can enjoy them and play from now to an eternity. Of course, they enjoyed that. But Peter said there's just one stipulation. Don't ever hit a duck with one of your golf balls. If you hit one of the heavenly ducks, you're going to regret it. Well, the men didn't really understand that because they've been playing all their life and never once hit a duck. But nevertheless, they just agreed and they began to play golf. Weeks went by and everything was fine until one day one of the men, sure enough, hit his golf ball near the water and it hit one of the ducks. They looked at each other and they didn't know what to say. And then off in the distance they see Peter coming to them and, and as Peter walks over to them he's dragging this not so attractive woman and he handcuffs this not so attractive woman to the man that hit the duck and he said, I warned you about hitting the duck and because you hit the duck you're going to be handcuffed to this not so attractive woman for the rest of eternity. Well, the two men continue to play. They play and they, they go through weeks and months and no ducks until one day the second golfer hit a duck. Just like that, here comes Peter again with another not so attractive woman. And he says, I warned you about hitting those ducks. And because you hit that duck, you're going to be handcuffed to this not so attractive woman to the rest of eternity. And he goes off and disappears as well. There's only one golfer left. And that one golfer just continues to play. Doesn't know what else to do. He plays for weeks, months. He goes six months. He hadn't hit a duck. And he's so excited about it. And then he sees Peter come off in the distance. And he's dragging this beautiful woman with him. And he brings this beautiful woman. And he handcuffs this beautiful woman to the golfer. And the golfer thinks, maybe I'm being rewarded for not hitting a duck. What? I don't know what I've done to deserve this. What did I do to deserve this, this gift of this beautiful woman and being handcuffed to her? And the woman says, well, I don't know what you did, but I had a duck. 
<laughs> Isn't it great that when we get to heaven, we're not going to worry about our physical appearance? We're not going to have to worry about with what we look like or what the world sees us as? Because when we get to heaven, we're going to be transformed into something that God has that is much better than anything we could ever imagine here on earth. As a matter of fact, our entire life is about being transformed into not, not what we are. God isn't necessarily as concerned with what we are or who we are. He's just as concerned, if not more, about who we can become, about who He can transform us into be, that Romans 12 passage. And that's why I appreciate the topic that you've been ass assigning us speakers of this transforming. And today we're going to look at the transformation that David goes through of being transformed from a shepherd boy into the king of God's greatest nation, Israel. But what's the process of that? How does God transform? How does God take a young boy who is a shepherd boy and make him into the king over Israel? Well, it's a long process. And it really starts back even before Israel even had a king. You see, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the, the people of Israel were getting ready to have another judge. Samuel was getting old, and he was going to appoint his two sons to be the next judges over Israel. Remember, Samson had been a judge. Eli had been a judge. Samuel was now the judge, and he was going to give those duties to his two sons. But the people, they got upset. And they said to Samuel, we don't want to have these two men rule over us because they're corrupt and wicked, much like Eli's sons. Instead, we would rather be like the other nations. We'd like to have a king. Well, God didn't want them to have a king, but nevertheless, he gave them a king. He wanted to be their king. He wanted them to see him as their ultimate ruler and authority and ruling over them as their king, but they wanted to be like the other nations. So God gave them Saul. Saul is appointed king in chapter, as king in chapter 9 of, of 1 Samuel. And Saul does a great job, but through a series of unfortunate events and failures, Saul messes up pretty bad. And because of his failures, because of his sin, God is going to tear the kingdom away from him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, he does that. He rips the kingdom away from him. When, when Samuel comes to him after he was commanded to destroy the Amalekites and how Saul kept back some of those things and kept Agag, and God says to Samuel, you tell him because you didn't do what I commanded you, I'm going to tear your kingdom away from you, and you won't be ruler of Israel very long. Well, in the very next chapter, very next chapter, in chapter 16, we see Samuel going over to the house of Jesse and finding the young boy, the runt of the group, the way it's defined, really, of the family of Jesse, the youngest son of Jesse, and he's anointed the new king over Israel. But here's the thing. He doesn't become king right off the bat. And if you've ever read the story, you know that's always been something that probably caught your attention. If God anointed him king, why is Saul still on the throne? Well, that's because God has to use David to train him how to be that king. And God uses the shepherding aspect to train David to transform him into who he really wants him to become. As a matter of fact, his entire life is about this transformation and the lessons he learned from being a shepherd and what that means to being the king. As I was jotting down some things to discuss with you about this subject, I had four different pages on my desk of all four different outlines I had sketched of four different directions I wanted to go. And I hope I chose the right one because there's so many other ways that we could go with this. But I want to use just these, just some words, just single words to help us learn how God used David and how God trained David and taught David through life lessons how to be transformed from a shepherd boy to the king. The first lesson we have is we had, David had to learn patience. You see, being a shepherd isn't an easy job. It required that you had to be patient. It was day after day, night after night, looking for water, being gone away from your family, sometimes days, weeks, maybe even months on end. You had to have patience because you, you weren't able to 
usually bathe during that time and you had to, to have enough food to last you that time. It was just a, a time full of patience that you had to endure. And the only way you endure is through learning how to endure, is by experiencing that. And as we mentioned, David had to learn patience that way, but he had to learn it in, in another way as well because he's anointed in 1 Samuel 16, but he doesn't take over the throne of Israel and Judah until 2 Samuel chapter 5. Now, I use, and one of my study Bibles that I use is the Thompson Cross Chain Reference. And in that Bible, it gives dates for each chapter to give you an idea about when the events of this uh, chapter happened. And if you look in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, it, the dates given, although it's not completely accurate, I'm sure it just gives us something to go by, it's 1046 B.C. 1046 B.C. But then in 2 Samuel 5, when he's officially becoming the king, it's 1004 B.C. So whether they're right or wrong, there's about 42 years between when God said, you're going to be my man, before David actually became the man. That's a long time. 42 years? If somebody made a promise to you but did not, didn't fulfill it to 42 years later? Boy, that'd be nice if I could go to a dealership and say, I'd love this brand new F-150. I tell you what, I'm going to pay you back over the course of 42 years. <laughs> we would say, they'd say no, that wouldn't work. Because that's a long time to learn something and to have a promise fulfilled but that's what happened with David, and he had to learn. He had to wait. And I guarantee you that as you go throughout this series with your other speakers, this is going to be a point that they all mention, is because Moses had to wait in the wilderness for those 40 years uh, as he's tending the flocks of Jethro. And, and Joseph had to wait while he's in prison and, and in Egypt before he becomes the second in command of all of e e Egypt. God is teaching these men that it requires patience. It requires patience to, to serve God. And He's promised us so many wonderful things, but He's not slack concerning those promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God's made wonderful promises to us that, that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. In John chapter 14, he made the promise to them, and that promise holds true for us, that if we're faithful to him, that he'll reward us with that home in heaven. That's faithful, but we have to be patient. Because just like Paul understood for me to live as Christ, to die would be gain, that I have a purpose here on this earth. I have a reason for living. God is using me, and I have to learn through patience before I can be transformed into the person that God wants me to be transformed into. David had to learn patience. David also had to learn that he needed courage. Now, it took a great deal of courage to be a shepherd, and you have to protect what's yours. And sometimes that means fighting off different wild animals and fighting off the heat and, and fighting off various things that, that might come into play as pitfalls that would uh, cause your, your sheep or your flock to be at risk. David had to face that. As a matter of fact, we see courage in David in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel when he takes on Goliath. You see, when he's going out to provide food for his brothers as they fight in battle in chapter 17. And when you look at chapter, 20, chapter 17 verses 22 through 26 of that story, we, we read that, that David leaves all the things in charge of the keeper and the baggage and he runs to greet his brothers and as he runs to greet his brothers he hears the challenge issued by Goliath. And David is just overwhelmed by the sense that no one has gone to fight. And so David says, I'll go fight. I'll go fight the Philistine. Could you imagine the looks on their faces when they see this little shepherd boy willing to go out and to fight this massive nine and a half foot giant and, and to face him? There's no chance. He stands no chance in their mind. But David has the courage to do it. It, was, it took courage for him to even say he was willing to do it. And when we continue on in the story in verse 34 through 37... We get to the story and Saul comes to David and David says to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. This is verse 30, 34 of chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. And when there came a lion, a bear, 
and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and I struck him. Could you imagine going to chase after a lion or a bear that had taken one of your sheep? That's what David did. I struck him. I delivered the lamb out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and I struck him and I killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them for he has defied the armies of the living God. Oh, that ought to give you chill bumps. Because what David is doing here, David is showing a great deal of courage of standing up for what he believes in and protecting what he feels is his. Just as I protected those sheep, he said, against the, the, the bear, against the lion. I, I took that lion by his beard and killed him if he took one of my sheep. How dare you guys not go after this uncircumcised Philistines who's threatening the respect, threatening the reputation the living God of Israel. When David goes out to fight, he runs and he shows a, a great deal of courage about what it takes. He learned that courage late, then that's going to affect him later on in life as he goes to fight all of those battles, as he goes to fight the Philistines again later on, as he begins to fight uh, the other nations that rise up against him. And David forms his group of his mighty men who have all this uh, amazing courage. God had to teach David courage before he could be the king over Israel. He taught him that while he was a shepherd, while he was learning. In fact, his entire life has been a process of learning of how God is going to use David and transform him into being who he wants him to be. Not only does it require patience, courage requires endurance. Being a shepherd required endurance. A great deal of endurance is a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week job. No clocking in or out. It's a job that you just have to endure as you're doing it. The word endurance means the ability to withstand hardship and adversity, especially the ability to sustain a prolonged, stressful effort or activity. Being a shepherd fits those qualities of enduring the hardship, the adversity that goes along with it. David had to deal with a whole lot of hardship as a shepherd. But even as David's life progressed, he had to deal with a whole lot of hardship in his life. And David learned to endure it. I mean, as a matter of fact, David's entire life was full of, of a roller coaster event of, of highs and lows, and sometimes they were very high, and sometimes they were very low, and sometimes it would drop from a very high to a low very quickly within just a matter of moments. But David continued to endure. Just follow this roller coaster with me for just a second. David had the high of his anointing and the defeat of Goliath, but not long after that, he had the low of having to live with Saul and jealousy that Saul had, and Saul trying to take his life, and David having to run away and leave his best friend Jonathan, and David hiding into caves, David pretending to be crazy, David joining the Philistines or, or trying to join the enemy. That's a huge low in the life of David. But then he has this, this high after Saul's death of becoming king over Judah. He has this high over becoming in chapter 5 of 2 Samuel the king over Israel. Then he seizes Jerusalem as a city that's going to be the capital city of God's people, the holy city of Jerusalem where God's temple is going to be built. That's a huge high for David, but not long after that, he has this huge high of bringing in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant that's going to be there for them to celebrate God being with his people, but then you have the low of him bringing the Ark of the Covenant in on a cart. You have the low of him doing it the wrong way. You have the low of Uzzah touching the Ark and dying. But then you have the high of them bringing it in the right way and them celebrating. And the high of David celebrating. But then you have the very quick low of David celebrating naked. And then you have, not long after that, you have the low of Bathsheba, the low of Uriah, the low of thou art the man, the low of the death of a child. But then there's the high of the birth of Solomon. And then quickly again, the low of the revolt of Absalom his son. The low of him having to leave the city of Jerusalem. The low of facing the criticism of all those people that were criticizing Shimei and, and others. But then you have the high of David coming back in. 
you have the high of the birth of Solomon. You have the high of David making plans to build God's house. You see, it's just a constant in the life of David. But God used those instances. He used those instances to teach David what it means when you fall for you to be able to get right back up. That failure is only failure if you stop getting up. That was an important lesson for David to have to learn. How was David able to to keep getting up? What gave him the strength to have this courage and this endurance to keep getting up? The fourth thing. I think it's because David knew what it really meant to be restored. It's so easy for us to be down on ourselves when we sin and when we fall. And sometimes sins are, are very horrible and they have lasting implications on the rest of our life and how disappointing that can be and how depressing that could be. David doesn't sink in a hole. He talks about being in the miry pit, in the, in the hard clay, in the, in the deep cistern, in the darkness, but he also talks about how the Lord lifted him up because David understood in this process of God transforming him from being shepherd to king, David understood and he learned what it meant to be totally restored and having that restoration. In the 23rd Psalm, there's a word used there that you might not know what it means unless you really examine it. When you look at that 23rd Psalm, he makes me, he leads me beside the still waters in verse 2, then verse 3. He restores my soul. Well, we know that to restore means to be brought back to its normal state, to renew, to be fresh. But in the Hebrew, that word restore meant a sign of repentance. It meant a form, an expression of repentance. And David understood that, didn't he? Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew that right spirit within me. You know, that Psalm 51 lets us know that David had some of these lows, but he was able to endure because he understood what being restored was all about. Because David had to do some restoration as a shepherd. You see, sheep oftentimes would slip and fall just because the ground was uneasy. And they would keep the wool on the sheep, and it would be very big because they would let it grow out. But sometimes when the sheep would fall over, they would get to where they could not get back on their legs. They would roll over on their backs, and because they're wool, they would lay there and not be able to get back up. Well, what would happen? The gases would build up in the animal, the circulation would stop in the legs, and he would die. And when he would die, the shepherds were, uh, would, would look for the buzzards. If they're missing one of the sheep, they would look for the buzzards. And the buzzard would give them an indication that there's one of the sheep that's either dead or dying. And they would follow where the buzzard would be. And they would see if the sheep was still alive. And if it was, the shepherd would, and the word used, restore that sheep by picking up the sheep and setting it erect, standing up, holding it between his legs, and rubbing the legs of that lamb to give the circulation back, talking to that lamb, soothing that lamb, bringing that lamb, restoring that lamb until it could walk on its own again. David knew what that concept was because he was a shepherd. He knew what it meant for God to restore him. And isn't that beautiful? When you read the 23rd Psalm and understand that, it adds a whole other dimension to it. He restores my soul. David endured. David faced failure, but David continued to get up. Maybe that's what part of it, that being a man after God's own heart, maybe God instilled that in him. David understood what it meant to be restored. Then finally, we learn dependence. David had to learn how to depend that was the only way that he could ever be king over Israel. That was the only way he could ever be pleasing in the eyes of God, is to learn how to be de dependent on God. And that would complete the transformation process of David's life. He learned to be patient. He learned to have courage. 
He learned to have endurance. He learned what it meant to be restored. All those lessons from being a shepherd taught him how to do these things and how to bounce back into life. But above all, out of all the lessons that we can learn from David, David knew how to lead because he knew how to follow. He knew how to follow the good shepherd. He knew to be dependent on God. David, there would be no way for David to be able to lead if he didn't have the example of the good shepherd. He learned how to lead by becoming one of the sheep. Isn't that beautiful? That's why he can say in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Or as the four-year-old girl said, The Lord is my shepherd. I got all I want. Everything I need comes from the true shepherd. David understood that. So as we learn how to be transformed in our own life from whatever we are until the glory that God has in store for us, it's going to take the same kinds of things for us. It's going to take patience. Be still. Psalm uh, Proverbs 37, 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently before Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Be patient in the Lord and wait. He'll provide for you. He'll take care of you. We need to learn how to be patient. We need to learn to be strong and courageous, to have that courage. That Paul says in Ephesians 6, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Chapter 6, verse 10, when he's talking about having the full armor of God, being strong in the Lord. That's what David learned, and we can learn the same lesson. But we also need to learn endurance. Because even though we keep going, we're going to continue to fall. We all sin. We all come short. We all miss the mark. But just like Paul, or just like rather James, when he says in James 1, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various kinds of trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or endurance. And that steadfastness, let it have its full effect on you, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James 1, 2 through 4. That that endurance teaches us how to get back, and we learn from those past experiences when we fall. We also need to learn how to be restored. Because when we fall, the only way to get back up is to ask for that forgiveness. After you've suffered a little while, Peter says in chapter 5 of 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 10, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That God will do something special through you. And then learn dependence. Always stay dependent on him. Always stay dependent on Him for all your needs and learn what it means to be a member of the flock, of the flock of God. I appreciate the time that you've given to me. I appreciate, I, I assume you've been attentive. I can't see you, but you can see me. But I want to close out with the 23rd Psalm in a prayer. And I think when we read that 23rd Psalm, we understand a little bit more of that transformation process that David went through, that God blessed him with. How David became a man after God's own heart. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You too can be transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Looking at the example of David, we can follow the same process. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this story, the life of David, and the examples that you teach us through him. We love you. We appreciate you and the, the gift of, of, of your word that you've given to us to teach us how to do these things and help us all to be transformed by the renewing of our mind as we study your word together 
so that we can all be together in heaven one day for an eternity. Bless this church. Encourage them. Lift them up. In Christ's name, amen. I look forward to seeing you sometime. Have a great evening. Thank you, Matt, for those awesome words from God's holy word about David. So much we can learn from David, but thinking about how David was transformed from being just a shepherd and how God then in turn transformed him into being a king and leading his people. You can be a person like David. So Matt, thank you so much for sharing with us tonight those powerful words about David and his transformation that God used him in preparing him as a shepherd boy to eventually be king of his people. Uh, we'll be off, uh, at least of our guest speakers, for the next couple of weeks. And then our next guest speaker will be with us on July the 8th. But tune back in because we'll also have videos for the next two weeks. And want to continue to encourage you to uh, meet back with us on Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. Uh, on our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel. But also come back with us on Wednesday nights as well. If you have an opportunity and you're in our area, uh, if you're not a member of our fam church family, uh, come and join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you are a part of our church family and you're not able to be with us, want to continue to remind you, you can still watch us live on Facebook.